much, Wendy. So, today I'm going to talk about the state of care and how to improve it in 15 minutes. So, hold on to your seats. Just, hopefully this slide won't come as a surprise to anybody, just about the role of CQC. Um, and we come from the perspective that people have a right to expect safe, good quality care from their local health and social care services. We've got a number of purposes, but today I'm going to focus on the last two bullet points, the speaking independently and the encouraging improvement bits. And when it comes to the speaking independently, we are mandated by government to publish an annual report about the state of care. And this goes right the way across all the sectors that we regulate, um, acute hospitals, community services, GPs, and adult social care. Uh, the report that we publish generally gets picked up pretty well in the media. Um, this year, it didn't get quite as much coverage as usual because of that B word that we're not going to mention. Um, but still has some very key messages within it. I think that one of the disappointing things, though, is that the messages that we're putting out in this year's State of Care report, we've actually been saying for years, and it hasn't changed. You're know, back in, oh, I can't remember when, when we published the Cracks in the Pathway document, which must have been, what, about 2013, 2014, we were saying that care was fragmented, that funding mechanisms didn't help, and that people experienced poor care at some point of their, of their care journey through dementia. And that hasn't changed. I suppose it's helpful to think about the analogy, which I'm sure you've all heard before, about airline travel. When we go off on our holidays, we assume, and we normally get, a fairly seamless service from the minute we walk into the airport to the minute we disembark at the other side, that we don't know, actually, that we're passing through different countries, different airspace, different owners. It happens seamlessly. And unfortunately, when it comes to receiving care, that is not the case. <coughs> Having said that, though, the quality of care across England is mostly good. And that's despite the challenges of workforce demand and funding. NHS acute hospital and core services, 60% good. GP practices, 91% good. Mental health core services, 70% good. And adult social care services, 79% good. Now, I have a bit of a challenge around those stats for adult social care services, because we lump all adult social care services together to come to that figure. And we know from all the work that we've done that actually people with a learning disability who are living in smaller services, we know smaller services function better, that they skew the figures. A far greater percentage of smaller learning, difficult learning disability services are rated good and outstanding than the larger nursing homes and services for older people. And that's one of our challenges for CQC this year, is to try and work out how we can get a better grip of the adult social care stats and maybe break them down a bit into working age adult and, op and older people's services. Because we have a real issue about, about getting dementia specific stats. We no longer register specifically dementia care services. It's all part and parcel of various different service types, which a provider self-selects when they register. So a lot of providers tick every single box to say, you know, they provide end-of-life care, um, care for learn people with a learning disability, mental health, and dementia, all in the one service. We're trying to work out what we can do to get some more granularity on that. Now, my focus, even though I'm a nurse, is unashamedly adult social care. And just to think about some stats and figures. Older people are living with dementia, long-term physical conditions, mental health needs, physical and learning disabilities. And although people are living longer, they're not living longer in good health. It 
Adult social care makes up an enormous contribution to the economy. We employ more people in adult social care than the whole of the NHS. The residential care services, lots of big numbers there, and again, we do need to slight caution about that around learning disability services, and community care, providing care for half a million people at any one time. And when we look in our state of care report, we reported a couple of years ago that we felt that we were approaching the tipping point for adult social care. And actually, for a number of services, we have already met that tipping point. It really is very fragile out there. And you know, I don't need to tell all of you about that, because you know, those of you who are providers and working in the sector know about that. Um, the particular bits that I want to pick up here are around unmet need. Um, we know that unmet need is increasing. One in seven older people are not having their needs met. We know as well that the eligibility criteria mean that there's been a 12% real-term cut in financial thresholds since 2010-11. It's a very difficult climate for people to operate in. So over the past year, we've seen around about 44%, of, uh, 44 councils reporting that home care agencies are handing back contracts. The pictures around nursing home beds is very mixed. In some areas, we're actually seeing a bit of a rise, but in another local authority neighboring, for example, we've got a 58% reduction. And again, we do need to take that with caution because we know that those figures are a bit skewed by a lot of um, learning disability services that have switched themselves from being residential to supported living. But getting good quality care actually there's, we know that there are five key factors that we'll pick, on, pick up on, and I know other people will be picking up on in the course of the day. So, quality of care for people, access to care and support, capacity to meet demand, that's a real biggie, isn't it, around the workforce, funding and commissioning, and a workforce to deliver care. And we know that, you know, for example, looking at capacity, that actually the impact of technology on capacity can have some really positive moves. You know, digital monitoring, electronic discharge summaries. I know we've got speakers coming up later on in this session to pick up on some of the technology innovations. Some of the evidence that we used in our state of care report came from a series of local system reviews that we did earlier on last year. And we did these at the request of the Secretary of State, um, who wanted us, primarily driven by um, a desire to reduce delayed transfers of care, but wanted us to look at um, how care pathways worked for older people across um, care journeys. So first of all, looking at maintaining the well-being of a person in their usual place of residence, looking at care and support in a crisis, and step down, returning back to usual residence. The areas that we looked at, we looked at 20 local systems, and those local systems were chosen by Department of Health and Social Care based on some metrics. So there were majority, the majority of them were, served, were local systems where they thought that there were some problems, but actually the themes and trends that we picked up in these looked as if they were going to be replicable across the whole of the sector. Um, and again, what I was saying before about older people potentially being a proxy for dementia. It's basically the best we've got, I think. So, what did we find? We published our Beyond Barriers report back in July of last year. Uh, it's worthwhile a look um, and a read because it's got some really good case studies in it. But basically, the NHS was designed back in 1948 and it can no longer effectively meet people's <coughs> needs in 2018. People are living longer with more complex needs. We're expecting care to be delivered by more than one organisation. We also rightly have greater expectations. So that human rights issue that Jeremy was talking about, people have the right to expect that their care is personalised to their individual circumstances. But the key thing is around integration. And just a little couple of little examples to bring that into focus. When it works well, 
we have an example of a lady, Mrs. Anderson, shall we call her, who fell, fractured her neck of femur, admitted to hospital, and actually her discharge planning work started the minute that she walked into hospital, or rather well, didn't walk into hospital, was trolleyed into hospital potentially, <laughs> yes, so we'll just pass that over on that one. She had a surgery, surgery went beautiful, surgery went really well, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team were actively involved, she had lots of assessments, she had some therapy, she was identified as being suitable for a rehab placement, went to a reablement centre, worked really well with the physios, the OTs there, and was able to be discharged home within a fortnight with a care package, um, needing just one sort of care visit a day just to check on her well-being, which actually she cancelled after a week because she said, you know what, I really don't need this. That worked really, really well. The local sectors all worked beautifully together. Conversely, let's think about Mr Johnson. He had a fall, he was admitted to a frailty unit, that should have been a really good move. But somebody in the frailty unit rightly thought, actually we're a bit worried about his mental capacity, let's do an assessment. He was referred for a doll's decision, that took about four days to come through. During that time he'd had an OT assessment, OT recommended, and understandably, a home visit to make sure that he could manage at home. Unfortunately there were no community OTs ready. So he stayed in hospital for around about 15 days. Normal stay in the frailty unit was around about, what, four or five days, if that. On day 14, the day before his discharge, he fell in hospital. He fractured his neck of femur and was in hospital for a further month and never really regained his full mobility again. That did not work well, did it? But... When we're looking at driving improvement, yes, it's easy to get quite discouraged by all of the doom and gloom and the challenges, but actually, when it comes to driving improvement across health and social care, a lot of it isn't rocket science. We've published a number of reports about driving improvement, which again are on our website, and I understand from our comms team that they're amongst the most um, downloaded um, articles that we have on our website. But when we look right the way across all of the sectors, we find that there are some key themes that stand out. And I'll pick all of these up in just very briefly in a moment. But basically, happy staff means better care. So, leadership. You really can't underestimate the importance of leadership and a shared sense of culture and values in services. Um, I was talking to chief exec of a um, provider organisation who have a large number of outstanding rated service, services. And she was telling me that when she walks into a care service, if she sees a tissue on the floor, then if she doesn't bend down and pick that tissue up herself, that sets out that message that actually it's okay for everybody else to walk past it. Similarly, if she walks past and doesn't engage with the lady who's sitting in the corner of the, the sitting room crying gently, help, help, again, that sets the tone that it's okay for everybody else to ignore that person. Jennifer, I think, gave us some very, very powerful examples of how we must ensure that people are at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and again, going back to that rights-based issues, that we need to look at people holistically, appreciating their life story. And again, Home Instead were picking that up as well, weren't they? I love the bit about incorporating activities. It's one of my little bugbears when you go into a care service and activities happen between two and a four, between two and four p.m. in the sitting room on a week afternoon. Actually, activities should be part, meaningful activity should be part of everyday plans. The workforce. We know it's really, really difficult out there, and we know that everybody would love to have consistency of staff, and it does make a massive difference. 
When we were doing the local system reviews, we heard from one lady who lived, um, who was prime carer for um, her husband who was living with dementia. And she was telling us that in the course of one week, her husband had 42 different care workers came through their front door, 42. Yes, it's, I suppose on one hand it's good that actually people, they, they were getting that level of support, but for this poor chap living with dementia, trying to engage and relate to 42 different people and relate his story to those 42 people. We also know that outstanding care doesn't happen in isolation. The very best services are open, they invite the community in, they share good practice, they, they go out there and they tell people what they're doing and also they listen to, state, to other stakeholders and take recommendations from them. Bringing the community into your home, again, don't work in isolation. We see, when we look at outstanding reports, and within CQC, when we're rating a service outstanding, um, we put it through quite rigorous QA processes. So, you know, I, I'm based in London, and we run panel, joint panels for London South for outstanding services. It's our little oasis of positivity on a Friday afternoon. The inspectors present to us the services that they think are rated outstanding, and we see some lovely, lovely practice. And a lot of that is around integration generational work, services that have the nurseries on site, invite the local schools in, invite the local cubs in, perhaps um, support schools with reading activities. It really does work beautifully and it benefits both the local community and the people using the services. I love this infographic here. It um, sets out really, I think, beautifully and diagrammatically what actually outstanding care means for adult social care. And I love that bit about care about rather for than caring for people and about relationships are key. Because really quality matters. It should be a joint commitment to improve adult social care. If you haven't looked at them already, some of the resources that are on the Quality Matters website um, about um, resources, no single person or organisation can improve the quality of social care on their own. We've got some really good stuff out there. CQC are taking the lead around data um, and using data intelligently. It, stalled a little bit last year but we're, we're resurrecting it with a with a bit of a bump this year so look out for stuff around that because actually all of us here really need to stand up for adult social care we need to celebrate the good but equally we need to stand up and challenge the bad it's a source of frustration i think to all of us that when we when we um rate a service outstanding we routinely do a press release for them, and we send that out to all of the local press in that area. And you know, I think in London, I can count on one hand the number of times that the local press have actually picked up that really good news story, whereas if we rate a service inadequate, they're all over it. That's not right, we need to get those messages out there. And remember why we do this. We nicked these slides from Community Care a couple of years ago. They were on their calendar, and we use them unashamedly because they're such lovely photographs. And if you want to keep up to date with some of the work that we do, we tweet, we've got newsletter. Please do, do sign up to them, and do get in touch if you'd like to share your views. That's everything I've got to say, so thank you very much.